Hello and welcome to Cyber Focus, your source for international business information. I'm your host, Tim Smith, and our guest today is Professor Terry Campbell. Professor Campbell serves as clinical professor of accounting here at the Kelly School of Business at Indiana University. Terry returned to us here at IU in August of 2008 after 20 years of college teaching abroad, mostly in Europe, the Middle East, and Asia. Terry earned his doctorate from Indiana University with a major in business economics and public policy, as well as accounting. In addition, he completed two postdoctoral studies in information systems with the University of Minnesota and Indiana University. Terry has published articles in several top periodicals and has served as associate editor for the Journal of Information Technology, the Journal of Accounting Education, and the Journal of Management Development. Professor Campbell's current research includes decision-making under uncertainty and examining the area of measuring the unmeasurable with special attentions to spent on the performance measurement and incentive systems in business today. Terry is a certified public accountant and holds several additional certifications. Prior to entering academia, Terry was chief operating officer of a multi-plant contract manufacturing company and has extensive retail management experience. Professor Campbell, thank you so much for joining us today. Glad to be here. Uh, <laughs> really appreciate, appreciate your time. Yeah. Well, great. So let's talk a little bit about the intersection between international business and higher education. Walk us through this junction and what it looked like in the past and help us better understand what it's looking like today. I think in the past the universities were quite separate from business on an international basis. Certainly when I first moved to Europe that was the way it was. The university is very separate and in fact in most places they still are. But most, uh, most locations have created some form of business school or some adjunct that's going to educate business people into probably what they should have gotten at the undergraduate level and now we're doing it at the executive level and that has matured over the years as well so we're seeing uh, lots of business schools show up lots of new business schools we've got some one of the business schools we work with in Poland is only 25 years old mm -hmm. it's fully accredited and has I think seven or eight thousand students there so uh, that kind of movement is what we have seen I think around the world. Early on in my career I w helped Copenhagen Business School along with my Danish uh, professor partner. We started an MBA program there and they'd never had one. So that was kind of an inspiring thing to do in the 1990s mm -hmm. to, to bring an MBA program from nothing to life and to discover how meaningful some of our rights are here mm -hmm. in regards to graduation. They had never had caps and gowns mm. in Copenhagen. It may be the happiest country, but they didn't do co caps and gowns. <laughs> and so we said, no, no, we should do caps and gowns for this graduating class. And their families are there, and there's more tears and happiness than you can ever imagine in graduation. So I think those, those two examples of bringing a couple of things together, that kind of shows where we are now. Great, thank you. So as a follow-up, what else do you think we're learning from this, Terry, as we continue to innovate within our programs, look to have robust curriculum that engages the students, gives them the fundamentals, but then maybe challenges them and helps them apply these skills in today's global workforce? Well, I'd probably refer to the history and then I'll bring it current. But the, when I first went to Europe, the interviewers that would come to campus for our MBA students and executive MBA students always wanted one key measure and that was intellectual curiosity. That was all they were worried about because the people that we would have would have some experience, not a business degree. They'd have their experience, they'd come for us for an MBA, we would put them through the experiential learning call now. We, I don't know what we called it back then, but whatever we did, we brought them through that and intellectual curiosity became the defining characteristic. We're seeing that evolve over the years, and now we're seeing that probably loop back into the United States over the last, what, decade? Whenever, whenever we've had action learning or experiential learning, we're starting to see that. It's, it's the intellectual curiosity that makes experiential learning work. Uh, 
So that perspective of intellectual curiosity being realized in higher education, how might we better bolster that to happen? Is it ha do we need to do more early on to help the students recognize the importance of it? Or how do you teach that, Terry, to help uh, us understand? Well, <laughs> as a grandfather of six, my <laughs> argument is very simple. Find something you're interested in and go do it well. Now, playing that out as you get older or you get into the university system and or your parents or grandparents want you to go to work, that intellectual curiosity gets modified. But I still maintain with our students here that that's one of the key things that we want them to do. Mm -hmm. For the early, and I think it's early, the experiential thing that we do for our sophomores, when mm -hmm. we take them on what we call 272 trips, these are one-week trips, uh, usually in spring break or in May, and they go to a different country, interview businesses, participate in activities, see the culture, experience something they've not experienced before, that typically requires some intellectual curiosity. And I think that we are, it's a seed mm -hmm. that we try to get into the sophomores. And we hope that that seed, when they come back, they continue to do that. Mm -hmm. Out of the 272 class, where I had 24 students to go with me to Switzerland in May of this year, seven of them have applied to study abroad. So these are typically people who have not been outside the United States, mm. and I have had people who had never been outside the state of Indiana go with me to Switzerland. Mm. So you, it's a bit different world. We, yeah. we do have Veve, Indiana, but we also have Veve, Switzerland. <laughs> I, take, I took them to Veve, Switzerland. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. So in Thomas Friedman's 2005 book, The World is Flat, it helped us catch up regarding what was happening on the globe as our connectedness allows for business to happen anywhere, anytime, and with anyone. So what are your thoughts about business education today? I think we should do it every place, anytime. Uh, but the connection, though, yes. you have to understand the connection. When I was traveling uh, out of Switzerland, one of the places I would go would be Africa. And I'm in Ghana doing executive education programs, and we're running, quote, the latest software, whatever it may be at that time. And we, they take us out on the Volta River to go up uh, for a uh, cruise. Mm -hmm. So we're cruising up through there, and we've got a Ghanaian or Ghanaian, uh, whatever it may be, rock music band playing Elvis Presley music to people from all over the world, but I'm the only American, yeah. and we're all enjoying it, and we go by a village, which I thought was a living village, like mm -hmm. we have here, and I commented to our host, I said, well, that's a living village. He said, no, it's not a living village, that's just a village, and they're down in the wall, you know, so we are doing the latest technology with our executives, listening to rock and roll from the U.S., and they've got a village, and we come back, and we go into session, and we're talking about different things, and you get to know some people, mm -hmm. And the punchline that's going to come on this is that one of the Ghanaian managers is talking to me about his children mm -hmm. who are the same age as my grandchildren. And he said, if I understand what is happening in our society in the future, my children will be competitors to your grandchildren. And I said, well, I'd hope they'd be collaborators. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. kind of flattening is what, uh, what I've observed for the last 30 years, actually. Yeah, and I would add that when I talk to individuals who have the opportunity to go abroad, and it is an opportunity, oh, yes. certainly, um, it's, it allows them to recognize the connected, connectedness. Correct. It also provides the perspective that I don't need to bring much anxiety to this relationship because we're actually so much more alike than we are dislike. And I've heard that play out in some beautiful ways, very meaningful ways for students when they're going into a situation and instead of saying, oh, you're doing it all wrong, they say, what is going wrong? How can we walk alongside you to solve this problem together? So that piece of collaboration, I appreciate you bringing that out because I hope too that there's more global collaboration uh, to the betterment of civil society everywhere. Well, our prime example in our 3-2 program is the International Field mm. Study, where our students go for seven weeks into an environment where they are literally on their own on some form of a project. We try to vet the projects, et cetera, and the locations. 
But in Hanoi, Vietnam, we are working with social enterprises there, trying to help uh, certain people in that society advance themselves. Mm. Uh, Vietnam is growing very fast. The economy is uh, going along. Lots of investments are being made. Uh, but there's still some people that get left behind, and, and we were very fortunate there to actually get a, get a uh, connection mm -hmm. where we can work with social enterprises that are helping people. And that's the rest of our projects many times are profit-seeking organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, th these are more social enterprises. Yeah. What kind of feedback are you getting from the students this, with this particular project? Yeah. In Hanoi, the students, uh, it's a transformative experience. Mm -hmm. All field study projects are intended to be transformative. This one was transformative for the four that went. Mm -hmm. They, In fact, it was so transformative that one of our students invited his parents over before the thing was over. Mm -hmm. And his parents came over and visited the site. Fantastic. So there was some, there's some really nice things that take place that we would not otherwise have available for our students without this type of connection and without this type of program. Mm -hmm. In a recent interview I had with Erica Kovacs in the Department of Management and Entrepreneurship, we spoke of leaning on Dean Kessner to make study abroad and experiential learning components a compulsory part of the curriculum. What do you think? We, uh, <clears throat> yes, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're recording this. I think I can say it politically correct. Um, <laughs> I would say conceptually, I have no problem with that. Mm -hmm. As an accountant, I'm trying to figure out how we could accomplish it. That would yes. be that would be the uh, so the challenge we have. So let's assume it was sustainable. You're oh. all for it. Oh yeah, sure. Great. And in fact, uh, the, for the 272 projects, uh, I tried to add those. Uh, Geneva has been my location because I live there, uh, but we've added Bucharest, Romania, mm -hmm. and one of our colleagues handles Bucharest, Romania now on a a seven-day project mm -hmm. taking sophomores over there. We have the commitment of Warsaw, Poland with our partner there. Mm -hmm. We have the commitment in Taiwan for another one, mm -hmm. and I have the commitment in Hanoi, Vietnam. So I have three 272 possible trips located. I just need faculty allocation. Great, so, so. it's a shout out for our <laughs> faculty friends here to consider this. Well, I've mentioned it to them, but I, <laughs> I don't do hard sell very well. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Terry. So, we understand a little bit more about how experiential learning is being realized here at the, the Kelly School within the Graduate Accounting Program. Maybe you would take a, a pivot here and talk a little bit about your research. I thought it was fascinating when you're looking at measuring the immeasurable. What does that mean in business, Terry? Okay. The origins of that go back to where I got involved when I moved to Switzerland. I got involved with the environmental faculty there, which mm -hmm. typically were not in the United States. Mm -hmm. so. Just a shout out to Francisco in Switzerland. Uh, and once he had educated me a little bit, I said, I said, you know, from an accounting standpoint, we'll count anything that you help us count. So the physical nature of the things that we're counting now completely have been added into what we call integrated reporting or corporate social responsibility or ESG, which stands for environment, social, and governance. Mm -hmm. So we have, from a measurement quantitatively, we probably have 300 measures. The carbon footprint, the water footprint, the uh, gender diversity, the board of directors diversity, uh, all of those types of things are available through a database that, that we connect to. It's not mandatory, it's not audited, all the data is voluntarily submitted. Mm -hmm. But it's been going on long enough now that we think the data is representative. So that starts that measuring process. Mm -hmm. The second measuring process of measuring the unmeasurable, I ran into when I was at Penn State from the engineering school. They acquainted me with bars. Mm -hmm. Some people are thinking something about bars. Yeah. Anyway, it's behaviorally anchored rating scales. And so you describe the behaviors you expect to see mm -hmm. at a high level, the behaviors you expect to see at a mid-level, and the behaviors you see at a low level. And then you compare the behaviors to that, and you can measure that. The example we normally use on a scale of one to nine, do I see a superior or do I see an inferior? We measure it, we quantify it, we put it out, but then if there's a gap, we know the difference and we know what the behaviors are that we're seeking. Mm -hmm. And this definitely works globally because we had 300 salespeople and sales managers come together in Copenhagen and we gave them a, uh, an, a we gave them just the uh, idea of where would you rate yourself mm -hmm. one to nine where are you oh we're seven or eight okay so that was the consensus 300 people seven to eight 
lot of peer pressure, a lot of social desirability. And then I revealed what the behavior anchors were, and I said, are these the right anchors? They looked at them, they said, those are the right anchors. And I said, does anyone want to change your vote? They said, yeah, we're a four or a five. Mm -hmm. I said, now do you know what you need to do to do a six or seven or an eight? So behavior anchored, behaviorally anchored rating scales. Fast. A great tool to measure the unmeasurable, mm -hmm. and it's a catchy acronym that most people remember in universities. Yeah, thanks, Terry. That's really great. Um, you know, I also read in your resume, you're talking a little bit about your Myers-Briggs teaching That's certification. <laughs> I also ran through the David Kiersey side of it, which built off of Myers-Briggs, and you know we're running all undergraduate and graduate students through Kiersey now here That's at right. Kelly. How is the self-awareness heightening, how is the social awareness heightening um, helping today's business students, in your opinion? Well, I became committed to Myers-Briggs because we were dealing with executives sometimes who didn't behave in teams properly. And we didn't have a behavioral psychologist with us. And so I, my Danish friend, I, I told him, I said, I'm never coming to one of these programs until I'm skilled in these tools. So I did all the certification, Myers-Briggs type indicator. It is not a test, it's an indicator, it's a straw in the wind, and it's self-awareness. Mm -hmm. For our university students, I think as long as we use Kiersey Bates and what they're doing, I think it gets a start as long as we don't try to anchor it that that's the only thing there is. So Certainly. that's number one. And number two, we're not trying to put you in a box. We're trying to help you understand who you are mm -hmm. and more than likely how you will develop over time. Mm -hmm. And if we can do that with Myers-Briggs type indicator plus Kiersey, then I'm, I'm perfectly happy. I, uh, I continually find tools uh, around the world and somebody will say they've got a new tool and then I'll look at the back of the book and they'll say we're basing this on Myers-Briggs. So from a practical standpoint, Myers-Briggs works around the world. Mm -hmm. It is not the big five, it is not the research-based one, but it is a practical application and it really, it really helps, I think, our students. We put our graduate students through quite a bit of it mm -hmm. and our goal is to arrive after a week or so is where's your best fit? Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of social desirability, and so you have to help them understand that their behaviors indicate who they really are. Mm -hmm. And ask your friends, ask your family, and then that gives them a, um, gives them a pattern mm -hmm. that, that they should, they, it doesn't block you in, it just simply says, you have a natural pattern of the way you do things, mm -hmm. and if you want to do it well, it'll look like this, and if you don't do it well, it'll look like this, and you should be aware of the differences. Mm -hmm. And that awareness, whether it's through study abroad or global consulting projects or even uh, an assessment tool, um, that heightened awareness, I think, empowers us all to be better decision makers. Correct. That's the whole idea, is yeah. to give, give personal growth is what we try to do. Yeah. Well, Terry, I want to thank you for giving personal growth to so many for so long and doing it here at Kelly for many years as well. No, I thank appreciate you. the opportunity to come back to Kelly. Sure. We're glad you're back here, certainly. And thank you so much for your time today. Right. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak pleasure. with you. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, Terry. Thank That's all, we, uh, all the time we have for this edition of Cyber Focus. Thanks for tuning in. If you have any comments or suggestions for future topics, please let us know at cyber. That's C-I-B-E-R at indiana.edu.